I think with everybody else, I just want to also um, say how heartened I am that the um, uh, endeavors of everyone, I think, motivated, as we will all acknowledge, by the uh, irrepressible energy of my very tall colleague and friend, Primesh Lalu, um, that it is being acknowledged uh, by the launch of this flagship program. I think we have, over the last few years, been going through very lively debates and conversations uh, with scholars in the country. I'm sure we've made some, as, as they call it, frenemies. Uh, but across the country and across the continent and the world about what it means to do humanities uh, in our context. And I think it, it's apparent to us all in whatever language we use that we cannot step out of our history um, and at the same time that we cannot be straight-jacketed by it. It took, as we all know, great feats uh, of, of imagination um, to transcend the despairing political moments that have got us where we are here today. And I don't, don't mean, of course, here at the flagship, but that too, uh, but in the country as well. And I consider what we do at places like universities to be exactly that. They are places that both strive to clarify where we are at as societies, but there are also places that nurture the creative spirit, as we've seen today, to offer us glimpses of the kind of societies, of course, that we want to inhabit. I'm going to outline very briefly uh, the problem that we are thinking about in the research platform on migrating violence. It is a platform that speaks to the specific hopes that underpin the vision of creating a non-racial uh, South Africa, but it is motivated by the view that the challenge South Africa faces after apartheid resonates across many parts of this continent. It is therefore a way in which we will foster thinking on and theorizing about the modern political subject, as we call it, but as a political subject in Africa. By that I mean that we are all political subjects, as James O'Good reminded us, that are the products of colonial and imperial predicaments. As societies, we have all tried in the wake of, the, of our colonial pasts to create new political communities, to foster new dreams, and embody new futures. But our experiences, as we know, have also been more often that of despair and tragedy. Tragedy we describe variously as fragmentation, as civil war, as terrorism, as fundamentalism, or as secession. And while I was working on a book on TRCs in Africa, I realized that the most pernicious violence of apartheid was not perhaps the gross violations of human rights that we heard at the TRC, that is its illegal violence, but rather in the everyday mundane legal violence of apartheid, in the laws that made the majority of the population strangers and foreigners in the land of our birth, that made us surplus people, forced removals, migrant laborers, vagrants, squatters, and as we heard earlier, estranged from our own languages. The majority found themselves subjects of ethnic Bantustans, not, of course, as citizens of a democracy. And at the heart of the matter was the question of who belongs and who belonged legally. The more we travel north across the Limpopo, the more we hear a similar story. It is a story about the disjuncture between where you are at and where you are from. And it is a story of the politicization of that question. The violence of insider and outsider is a traveling story then. It is a story of violence migrating or migrating violence. Yes, migration is both a political question and an economic question. The market moves people and creates new subjects. From a decimated peasantry, we created industrial workers. From landowners, we created landless poor and urban squatters. But it is our wager that the question of migration is also a question uh, of the of is also a question of where culture and politics meet. When we historicize the question of migration in the colonial world, that intersection between politics, but between political identity and cultural identity becomes clearer to us. In colonial modernity, we know that attachments to group identities were consigned to the sphere of culture, while freedom was designated as that which flourished in the sphere of individualized civic life. 
the grounds of a modern political community coupled to a capitalist market economy, we were told, would offer the promise of a peaceful future best suited to the flourishing of human freedom. In Africa in particular, the trouble in realizing this image of the good society has been defined as the cultural problem of the persistence of tribalism. We might now add more prominently after northern Mali and northern Nigeria, religion, and after the battle over the legacies of settler colonialism that was still ongoing in southern Africa, we add race. When many of us ask, will we move beyond the triple burdens of race, of tribe, and religion? These, many of us say, work against the aspiration towards abstract equality and citizenship. Think of the Amazaghan, Tuaregs, and Berbers that cannot be incorporated into Libya, Mali, Tunis, Chad, Niger, and Algeria. Think of the Banya Rwanda who live in Kivu and Congo for generations now and who have tried to change their identity to Congolese or the Banya Mulenge or Tutsis in South Kivu who changed from Banya Rwanda to the people from Mulenge, the Banya Mulenge. But yet the colonial inheritances of citizenship keep them separated from Congo as foreigners, not natives. Our, CH, our PhD fellow Jacob Kluti is doing interesting work on this. And I think, and think of the Hutu among the Banya Rwanda there that cannot return to Rwanda because they are tainted as perpetrators of the genocide, a question of victim's justice that another of our students, Navbachu, is writing an MA thesis on. Think too of northern Nigeria, the struggles where the conflict is fought on, re on religious grounds, and in the south where it is fought on ethnic lines, where colonial rule politicized religion in the north and tribalism in the south. Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab have not emerged out of a divine nowhere. They are not simply iterations of a global Islamist threat, but they have intensely historical, regional, and national dynamics that propel them. The unresolved inheritance of belonging and citizenship is then the scarlet line that runs deep into the soil of these conflicts. Our current predicaments demand then fundamental inquiries about the inheritances of citizenship defined by imperial and colonial rule, and the challenges these continue to pose for the promises of emancipation and equality for political subjects who might be said to always be attained, uh, defined by their attachments. These questions that we will investigate over the next few years under the thematic of migrating violence are based on the assumption that the promises of liberal freedom of the individual as a political subject without attachments might be a hope that sets us up for more tragedy. The challenge might not be the old question of how do we take culture out of politics. Instead, the challenge might be to think about the question differently. If colonial rule politicized culture then should our question not rather be, how do we imagine post-colonial futures where culture is depoliticized? In the language of our current South African political discourse, it would be to ask, can we decolonize culture? It is our intention then, through this research platform, through the thesis that we will produce and the thinking that we're going to cultivate as a platform of the flagship, that when we move away from the despair of a discourse of failure as a mode of analysis, that we can begin to theorize our political modernity in the positive rather than in the negative as a question of what we are becoming with all its inherent messiness. Thank you. <laughs>